beautiful city of God. Let's all pray together. Our Father in heaven, we know it's cold today, but we thank you, Father, for all the seasons of the year that keep life on this earth going, and bring us times for planting, for harvesting, to help us to appreciate the warmer days. And we ask a special blessing this morning on on uh, Robbie and Hester and. That she is very sick, please be with her and that she can get the care she needs. We pray that you continue to be with our sister Joanne as she goes through all the changes in her life of losing her husband and our brother Larry. And help us as your people to do whatever is necessary to help her. We ask that you would be with others that have been mentioned that are in need of our prayers for physical health more than anything else, dear Father, we pray for people's spiritual health, that they would allow the things that happen to them physically to cause them to think about you, to think about Jesus Christ, to think about eternity, and turn their hearts toward you and Christ so that they may be your children and be faithful. We pray for the situation in between Russia and Ukraine and all the turmoil. We especially pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ in either of those countries who will be struggling and that their faith would not fail. We know that tragedy comes it's inevitable at times, and we can't change that, but we pray that you'd be with them, that they will not lose their faith and hope in you during this time of crisis. We pray that something might be said or done to bring about peace between those people. Most of all, that Jesus would be known and understood and obeyed. We pray that you would be with this church and help us as we studied this morning to be encouragers to one another to lift one another up help us to keep that mindset to help each other we pray father as we go into this worship that we'll sing with the spirit and sing with the understanding we'll pray with the understanding we'll pray with our spirits in a few minutes as we look together at your existence We'll learn from that and learn to trust and depend on you even more. As we take Lord's Supper in a little while, may we focus on the death of Jesus and his wonderful love for us and give him his life. And we thank you for another opportunity to be together. Help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We know we sin, Father. We break your heart. Help us to be penitent and do better. Please forgive us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> Number 225. Heaven holds on to me. Number 225. <clears throat> Earth holds no treasures but perish with using. However precious they be.
second, fourth verse. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell Could we cover everything 
that needed to be covered answer that question. Why believe in God? Or you could ask the question, is there a God? Some years ago, a very simple illustration was given about a watch. And I don't know if you can hear this or not. I'm going to test it. Can you hear it? No. Well, it's a pocket watch, probably made in the 1920s. And if I look at it very closely, it says Elgin on it. If I take the back off of it, which I shall not do here, lest I expose it to something I don't want to, I can see the inner workings of this watch. Now, I, I'm going to tell you that this watch made itself. It just appeared out of nowhere. I, I found it in a box at my dad's house and after he passed away and my brother and I talked about things that were his and I said, I'd like to have that watch. He said, fine, but nobody made it. It just happened. Now, there's not a person in the world that wouldn't laugh me out of the room for making such a statement. But when it comes to the existence of God, they change, some people change their approach, do they not? And it's really a simple, very simple illustration. I probably will take up a little more time next Lord's Day and talk about this more from a different angle. But I want to think about some things this morning about why we believe in God from a, some very practical observations. Let's forget about the Bible for just a moment and just understand that we're here. And I, I want to forget about that for just a minute and I want to get into it. We are here, are we not? We have a sense of touch. We have a sense of sight if we're not blind. We have a sense of hearing if we're not deaf. We have a sense of taste. And, and we have emotions. We have the ability to think, to reason, to choose, to refuse, to observe and say, I see it, or deny that it's there even though it's in plain sight. We are very complex individuals just thinking about ourselves as human beings. We also know there is a universe. And we know that we have a limited ability to explore this universe. We can't go just anywhere we want to in the universe. Now you can take a spaceship and the suits and all the, the whatever's necessary to survive for some time out there in space and some kind of machinery, but you cannot live on the moon. You can't live on Mars. You can't live much higher in the atmosphere than the highest mountains unless you have some kind of extra oxygen. It's just very clear that we're here and we're limited. And yet, this world came from somewhere. The question is where? How? From whom? Now, typically, we as God's people, at least I as one of God's people, a very limited apologist at best, but I do want to, an apologist is one who looks to defend creation and God. It's not making an apology, it's making a defense. And so in 1 Peter 3.15, Peter would say we should give a reason to everyone, an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. Why do you hope for eternity? In the 1970s, Thomas B. Warren had a debate with a British man by the name of Anthony Flew. The, logically and, and everything put together, Brother Warren defeated Anthony Flew because Anthony Flew was an atheist and he was only prepared to deal with arguments when he was given enough time to do so by responding and writing. Brother Warren wore him out. I'm not saying that with arrogance. But Brother Warren's arguments could not be defeated. Sometime later, Mr. Flew came to believe in God, and he wrote a book about it. 
But the New York Times reported when he died that he really didn't know about eternity and he didn't really want to exist forever. I said that for a reason. We want to believe in God, but we want to do more than that. We want our belief in God to take us somewhere, to give us some conviction, to give us purpose on this earth and hope for eternity. I find it to be simply amazing that the first verse in the Bible gives a very clear description of the five basic laws of science written by, as Jesus would say, a man by the name of Moses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Beginning is time. God is the force or the power. Created is energy. The heavens is space and the earth is matter. Those are the five basic elements of science. Did that just happen? Did somebody just make a lucky guess? Or is it possible that an eternal God revealed this to a man named Moses and left it here for our reading and for our study, for our comprehension and contemplation? You can't deny that these, these facts are here. Regardless of how they got there, they are there, and that's how the Word of God opens. That, to me, is a powerful evidence that somebody told Moses about that. And it's interesting how that it is in order. There's an order to it. Time did not begin. God doesn't live in time. We do. And time was set in motion, and, and it was done by God, and his creative power was the energy. And then he created the heavens, that space, and then he created matter. Think about time for just a moment. We are very limited on Sunday morning on what we can talk about, lest the seat uh, endures more than, more than normal. And I don't want to keep you too long, but I want to give us some powerful things to think about. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible talks about the purpose of the, the luminaries, the sun and the moon and the stars that help us keep track of time. And so the earth, the earth spins and it continues to do so. And it, and, and, and do, and it, go, it not only is it spinning on its axis, it's also on a rotation around the sun in approximately 365 days. Now every once in a while, every now and then you'll have this leap year, so it's not a constant, perfect timing, but it does give us time. And so the Bible teaches us in Genesis chapter 1 about the days and, and then seasons and years. The farmer's almanac has been used by, for many years by people studying studying and watching the, the, the seasons of the year and knowing when to do what, the, the different phases of the moon and things like that. And the Bible is very clear in Genesis chapter 1 that God gave us those luminaries so that people could even know when to plant. And how also as the earth goes around and it's around the sun, the, it's on an axis for a reason. It's colder today than it will be in June. And next year, we come around to February or, or January or whatever, it'll be cold again, and then you'll see the spring weather come in April and May. And, and it's not always the same, but it's close enough to say we're still in winter. Why? Because God set this in motion, and we can count on it. We can depend on it. How old are you? I'm 67. How do I know? Because the earth goes on a circuit around the sun and we can keep up with years. And, and it's not that hard to do. Why does that happen? How did that happen? These are just things to think about. And I want to go to this a little bit further. God is the force. And energy God created. Energy God made in Genesis 1. Energy God formed, <coughs> energy God fashioned. 
So this is just somebody's idea. We really don't know what the earth looked like when it was without form and the darkness was on the face of the deep and God said, let there be light. We really don't know what that looked like. Nobody was there. And certainly if they had been, they wouldn't have had a camera. We, so we just kind of guess at what it might have looked up like. But the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And then the next thing you see is that in Genesis 2 and verse 7, that God took some of that matter, the dust of the earth, and he made a man out of it. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul or a living being. How does dirt come to life? I have to ask the atheist this question. Even the, the skeptic. Or the, the agnostic. We're here. Does life come from life or not life? The very question is fundamental to everything we're talking about. Life comes from life. We can observe that. There had to be something or someone that was living to create the heavens and the earth. There had to be something or someone that was living to give life, not to the, to the earth, but to the microorganisms all the way up to the human being. Something or someone gave life to matter. The Bible says that God did it in Genesis 2 and verse 7. And then we read, then we read that God fashioned a woman into the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. So you know where the idea of women's fashion came from? But seriously, God formed man, but a different word is used when he talks about Eve. He took that rib and he, he fashioned her, and he sure did. Y'all are prettier than we are. You're, you're fashioned better than we are. And that's why we're attracted to females. But who, did, who, who here's another question. If, if all this life came from non-life, what made a male and a female and gave them the ability to reproduce and multiply and fill the earth? What gave the animal kingdom the ability to mate and have children? And if there's nothing miraculous about a man and a woman coming together and ultimately having a child, but there's something miraculous about how that man and woman got here. There's something miraculous about that. I'm asking people to think about how we got here. We can go into all these scientific discussions and all these so-called conflicts and contradictions, but the question still has to be answered. Where did life come from? The atheist, the evolutionist cannot answer that. They say it came about by spontaneous combustion. Well, what caused that? I mean, the idea has, the question has to be answered. And that's kind of what I want to spend some time on this morning. I want to talk about a couple of laws. And I got my information from scientific websites from people who may or may not believe in God. But there are laws at work in our universe. You have the first law of thermodynamics, or another way of stating that is the law of conservation, which says energy can neither be created or destroyed. In the beginning, God created energy. Energy brought the world into existence. Take God off the table for a moment. Something brought the world into existence because we have energy. Scientists know that. Where did that energy come from, Mr. Scientist? I just want an answer. I'm going to the basics here. And it's proven that energy cannot be created or destroyed. So, however much energy there is, or was, this is what the scientists say, how much energy there was at the start of the universe, whether that in their mind was so many billion years ago, or in my understanding, 6,000 years ago, there will be that amount at the end because it is a constant. 
I don't want to make this lesson any more difficult to understand than I can, but you know energy's here. You breathe, don't you? The sun burns, doesn't it? You have electricity, and you can depend on it. Now, you can harness it. Where did electricity come from? It's a source, it's some kind of energy source. And there are scientists who could do a really good job, much better job of what I'm about to say, and I'm just looking at one or two aspects of it. The first law of thermodynamics says if energy is here, it cannot be created or destroyed. The second law of thermodynamics is an extension of the first law, and it's called entropy. And I want to talk briefly about that in a very simple way. This, some energy heated that pot. It was on a stove, it was on a fire, some form of energy heated that pot and the water that was inside. What's the entropy? The entropy is the energy that is lost. What is lost here? So you pour that hot water into that container and what's coming out of that container? Steam. Energy is being lost. And this will make sense in a moment, I hope. It's being lost because of the law of entropy. What gave that, where did the energy come from? Somebody said the stove. Where did the, where did the electricity come from? It came from the earth. Who started all this? What gave this world energy to begin with? What keeps the earth on its axis at the right angle, spinning so many miles an hour per second and going around the sun every 365 days? What keeps that in motion? Energy. Where did that energy come from? But we talk about the law of entropy very quickly. Entropy is the loss of energy of some, some source that has caused it. Now, I know you can't see all the details from that from where you're sitting, but entropy is the measure of, hold on to that word, disorder. This comes from scientists, not the Bible, not from me. The entropy is a measure of the disorder of a system for energy to do work. In other words, you measure it that way. So you have a solid, goes to a liquid, it goes to a gas, and, and I know you can't see it, but in, on that, above that line with the arrow, he says increasing entropy is increasing disorder. Pause. There may be somebody come along on the internet and try to destroy what I'm about to say, but I don't think they can with reason. The laws uh, the so-called theory of evolution said, well, everything's some, not all scientists believe in the Big Bang, but they all believe that some, everything started somewhere, somehow. And supposedly, things got better. Some single cell somehow multiplied itself into multiple cells and gave us all the variety of life and then ultimately, all these variations of, of the animal kingdom, and you got fish, you got land animals, you got human beings, you got mammals, you got anthropods. I mean, you want to name all these things. All that supposedly started from a single cell, and it's supposed to be getting better. The law of entropy says it doesn't work that way. The law of entropy says things are getting worse. The scientists know that. The energy was there, but everything starts decreasing because of the law of entropy. That's why you're aging. That's why I'm aging. That's why even Methuselah only lived 969 years because no human being can live forever in a physical body because of the law of entropy. Who made that man? What power brought life into this world? And then we'll look at some other things, but is that making sense? If it's not, just think about it. But these are the scientists say that entropy is the measure of disorder. So a room just automatically cleans itself up, doesn't it? 
I mean, you could you could have it real neat. I mean, you, you should just pile it up. You need to see my garage. No, you don't. And I'm going to walk in there. If I leave, if I give it enough time, that garage will organize itself. And everything will be in its place. And something that's not working might just start working. There won't be any dust in there. Everything will fine. And we know better than that. But you see, evolution tells us to believe that. Theoretically, about how the world got here. And supposedly things are getting better. Did you know that you're not any smarter than Adam? You're not. I'm not. But I do know this. Adam died. 950 years of age. And I know that my daddy died at age 83. People die. Because of the law of entropy. Now, think about it a little more. So the law of entropy shows that the universe is running down. I looked it up on the internet and I'm just going to share with you what I found from a scientific site from evolutionists. Ever since its formation, or now this is what they say, 4.5 million years ago, Earth's rotation has been gradually slowing down. It is a process that continues to this day and estimates suggest that the length of a day currently increases by about 1.8 milliseconds every century. We're slowing down. So at some point in time, maybe a day was only 20 hours long. Now, we're, I'm not buying the millions of years of age. I'm just telling you that they know that the Earth is slowing down. Why? Because of the law of entropy. Things slow down. The law of entropy says things age, things <coughs> deteriorate, things fall apart, things rust, they corrode, they age, they die if they're living. But the energy, the first law of thermodynamics says energy can neither be created or destroyed. What brought this about? God did, the Bible says, but these are things that the scientists say, but it's, and this didn't come from a scientific site, but it agrees with what the scientists say about entropy shows that the law of the universe, that the universe is slowing down. A brother in Christ says this, and I'm reading this on an internet site from people who probably don't even believe in God. And so the earth is slowing down. It's not getting better. Evolution would have us to believe the opposite, though, would it not? That, that's well at one time it was just all disorder and it's becoming more and more orderly scientific observation says that is not so so and so it's like a piece of clothing this coat is probably 15 years old in 25 years it probably won't be fit to wear if some moths get a hold of it it won't last that long entropy is real clothing wears out and nothing we can, there's nothing we can do about it. So it's moving from an orderly state to a state of disorder. Now, what does the Bible say about this? If you can't read it, open your Bible to Psalm 102, and let's look at verses 25 and 27. And for the sake of time, I'll go ahead and read the text. The psalm is talking about God. It said, from old, you founded the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you will endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment. What will? The earth and the heavens? Like clothing, you will change them and they will be changed. But speaking of God, but you're the same and your ears will not come to an end. That is scientifically proved, declared even by evolutionists and atheists if they study science because of the law of entropy things are aging they wear out how did the psalmist know that 1000 bc how did isaiah know they stated something very similar in isaiah 51 how did isaiah know that at around 700 bc he didn't go to science class David was not a scientist, he was a shepherd. How did they know that? 
And how did these men know that and they didn't even know each other? Somebody said, well, they, Isaiah just copied David. Maybe he did. But who told David? Who told Moses that in the beginning, time, God, energy, uh, force, created energy, the heavens, space, and the earth? Is that just a lucky guess? And do we have those things? The idea, this idea of entropy is problematic for the naturalistic theories like evolution because evolution requires life to defy entropy and be constantly evolving into more complex orderly forms. And if you don't believe that, then you've not studied what the evolutionists are teaching. If it started as a single cell and has come to what we have today, that's the very opposite of what science teaches about what happens to living things. Supposedly, life started out as a single cell organism and through evolution, eventually ended up human. Did you know there is no proof of crossbreeding between species? Now, an animal may adapt to wherever it is. No question about it. This human can adapt. I spent so much time in Nicaragua about 12 or so years ago. It is hot in Nicaragua. You just think it's hot in South Georgia. It's hot. And, and I stayed down there so long, I didn't even want to be in air conditioning. I was outside, my body was getting conditioned to the heat. And I came home and I was cold in my own house. So the body can't adapt. But I'm not going to change into some other kind of creature. My skin can probably, you know, get used to certain things, and your body has the ability to condition itself. That's how people can live in Alaska. They learn to deal with the cold. And that's why people who live in Central America, when they come up here to visit, they're going to wear a coat twice as thick as yours because they're used to the heat. But if they stay here like some have, they start dressing the way we do in the wintertime. But there's a vast difference in that and saying that a lizard can ultimately come, they come from a fish, become a lizard, and ultimately become a man. There's nothing in science that proves that. Evolution requires up. The evidence, however, shows down. Now, think about, go back to this. These five basic laws of science, which we cover. You've got time, force, energy, space, and matter. And you can't deny that that exists. Now, think about this again. We got, so, so the earth was without form and void. Where did the matter come from to create the earth? Now, the scientists will say, well, evolution did that. There's nothing that proves that evolution can do any such thing. Evolution is more like devolution, that is, it goes the other way. And things do not evolve and get better, and there's nothing that proves it. The only one who could bring order out of chaos is God. And he did. The Bible teaches in Hebrews 11 that, that, that we, by faith we believe that the heavens were created by the word of God because we weren't there. But there's something to observe. Sun came up this morning. The sun comes up every day. You have sunshine every day. It may have clouds between the earth and the sun, but the sun's still there. It doesn't go anywhere. Clouds may keep you from seeing it. Rain may keep you from seeing it, but the sun is still there. Who put it there? And why is the heat from the sun perfect for the environment of human life on earth. Why are our surroundings so perfect as they can be that we can live maybe a hundred years if our health allows and we don't get in an accident? Why is the oxygen level just right? Why is the temperature just right? So that it's never just right. You never have been in a church building. It's too cold for the women and too hot for the men. But but you understand the point. And why is it that your body can adapt? Your heart races when you run, but you're sitting in a chair, it keeps a certain heart rate. 
Because the body has to compensate for the energy that's lost. Why do you sweat? Because the body has to relieve itself of the pressure. Why do you shiver? To keep your body warm. That's really what it's trying to do. So then you have these things. Man is made out of dust in Genesis chapter 2. The Bible says that's exactly where we're going back to. I've never been by a cemetery yet that that wasn't so. It happens. And there you have Eve. But I want to talk very quickly about Genesis chapter 1. And think about this. We're on time limit on Sunday mornings. So I will not read all of Genesis chapter 1. But I want you to read it and notice the order of things. God is a God of order. On day 1, you have the heavens, the earth, and the light, and the separation of light and darkness. On day 2, you have the firmament, or the expanse is a better word, and the separation of the waters that are on the earth and the waters that were above the earth. And then you have the dry land and then you have the seas. Now, isn't it necessary for certain plant is it necessary for plants to have water? Sure it is. Uh, even a cactus needs some water. It can't live without it completely. And then you have the dry land, the seas, the plants. And then, on the, on the fourth day, you have two great lines. The text doesn't say it's the sun and the moon. That's a name that man gave to them. But we know that's what they're talking about. One light to rule the day and one light to rule the night. The earth is never in total darkness. It may seem so, but there always is a measure of light. That's why some animals can navigate at night, and I'm not talking about bats. I'm talking about some animals can see in the dark because it's not totally dark. And so you have those two, and then they're given for seasons, days, and years. On day five, you have the birds and the sea creatures. On day six, you have land animals and humans. Now look at the order. First of all, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light. He wasn't talking about the sun. Um, some kind of light was created. I don't know what, but there are more lights. There are ultraviolet rays. There are infrared lights. There's, just all, there's more light than just the sun. And the, the moon doesn't put out any light. It reflects light. It's not a source. It's a reflector. The, moon, the sun is the source of light for our life, but there was light before that. But then you have the separation. It was necessary for God to take that shapeless mass and shape it. And ultimately, he, he, would, he would create the seas and then the plants. You see the order. I don't have to explain it to you. This is this is first grade science. If you have a first grader that's normal, that you cannot have. And, and so why is it when when we were in school, we may be given a plant, and you and you why did you put those plants in the window of the schoolroom? They had to have sunlight. And why did your teacher say, now you know you need to water this, and we're going to watch it. We're going to watch it grow because of photosynthesis that keeps that plant alive. And so it was necessary to have the sunlight, which also discredits the, the, the so-called teaching of theistic evolution. These couldn't have been days of millions of years. How long would a plant live without the sun? The Bible teaches it was a 24 hour period. And so the next day after the plants were made, God made the sun. And he's creating all this, and then the crowning creation is you and me. To stand here and think about it and look at it and say, well, forget about the Bible for a moment. Let's say you never saw one. I got here somehow. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11 says that God said eternity in man's heart. There's never been a culture that didn't look for some kind of God. Read your bulletin article and get more scriptures. But there's never been a culture that hasn't, doesn't look for some kind of God. Why? 
who put the idea of God in a man's mind if it doesn't exist? Next week we'll talk more about that. You can only imagine something that's been put there one way or another. That's just common sense logic. So think about it a little more. So you have this engine running, and this is more intriguing to us men. You've got this engine running, and we know that that engine requires a battery to start it, some kind of fuel to keep it going. It requires oil to keep it lubricated. It requires electricity to fire the spark plugs. It requires compression in all the design. Who made that? Oh, it just, we know that a human being made it. What about the heart, the human heart? Who made the human heart? Where did it come from? You should, I want somebody to make a human heart in science lab. Why is it that my nephew's looking for a kidney and they can't make him one in the lab that'll function in his body? Only God can make such as that. It took a creator to do such a thing and it's amazing to me that people can observe the engine or a pocket watch or the world and say, well, it just came here out of nowhere. But then you show it and say, well, what kind of car is it? Well, it's a Chevrolet. Who made it? Nobody. They, you know, but the inconsistency is amazing. A normal heart rate for an adult is about 60 to 100 beats per minute. So at least if we not go see Dr. Myers or you go see your doctor, that triage nurse will check your heartbeat, check your blood pressure, because there's something there. The heart beats about 100,000 times a day, 35 million times per year. During the average lifetime, the heart will beat 24.5 billion times. Who started that heart? Who started Adam's heart? Who put blood in his veins? Who made the veins for the blood to course through? Who put the bones in that body, the marrow in the bones, the brain in that man to think and to reason, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, all of the things that we have. It didn't just happen. Hebrews chapter three and verse four says that every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. The idea there was talking about Christ, but the statement still stands for what we're saying. In Job 38, God asks Job some questions. And I, again, because of time, I'll ask you to just write it down. This note's not in your bulletin, but read it sometime this afternoon. So with Job, just getting down to the end of Job, and, Job, and God asked Job a question in verse 4 of Job 38. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Where were you when I... Who set its measurements, since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? Or on what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the star, morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who enclosed the sea with doors? When bursting forth it went out from the womb? When I made a cloud its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band? And I placed boundaries on it and set a bolt and doors. And I said, thus far you shall come out, but no further. And here you shall, shall your proud waves stop. Have you ever in your life commanded the morning, God asked Job, and caused the dawn to know its place? And he goes on with question, questions. Where did all that come from, Job? Job is about suffering. God is asking Job the questions about where everything came from. He said, where were you? Well, the answer is he wasn't there. Somebody was. Somebody was there. And the question has to be answered. And what keeps this in motion? Who started it? What keeps it in motion? Just that one thing. And why is it that gravity is here and we don't go flying off into space? There are so many, many, many more questions that we could ask. And I went on more time than I thought I would, but I'm going to have to stop. And I have to ask this question. Laying all this 
the side. Somebody said, that's a pretty good presentation, preacher. <laughs> well, I hope it was. But the real question is, okay, in view of all this, how am I responding to this God? <clears throat> how am I responding to him? Is he more to me than a creator? Is Jesus more than just a savior? Or is he my Lord? The Bible teaches he did it. Very clear. John teaches that he did it. Paul taught that he did it. But he did more than that. He came here, born as a little baby, lived life as a human being. God did. And ultimately died on the cross so we could have our sins forgiven. If there's a God, and the Bible is true, then sin is real too. And the death of Jesus is real. And the love of God is greater than the foolishness of any scientist's question. Isn't it wonderful that God did more than just make us, but he provided for us a Savior to get us out of this world that's slowing down and one day will be burned to a crisp. Where will we be in eternity? It all depends on how we look at God. If you need to respond, please do so as we stand and as we sing. Careless soul, why will you linger wandering from the fold of God? Hear you not the invitation? Oh, prepare to meet thy God. Careless soul, oh, heed the warning for your life.
for the Lord's Supper what he did for us he's asked us to do this in remembrance of him I'm going to read 299 if you want to get your song books out and look at number 299 I'm going to read I stand amazed what the Lord has done for us at this time there's nothing we can do to uh, repay what he did for us so as we partake of this let's do what he asked us to do let's think of what he went through remember the crown of thorns that were shoved on his head, how they raised him up and slammed the cross down in the ground while he was nailed to it, just all the suffering and the beating that he went through, and he did it out of love for us. Number 299, I'm going to read everything and then I'll finish with the uh, chorus. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. For me it was in the garden he prayed, not my will, but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat, sweat drops of blood for mine. In pity angels beheld him and came from the world of light to comfort him in the sorrows he bore for my soul that night. He took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. When with the ransomed in, glo ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see, t'will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be, how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Bow with me. Dear God in heaven, we are so thankful for this wonderful love that Jesus had for us, what he, what he did for us, dear God, and still loves us as he's given us the plan of salvation, dear God, and also given us the life to live, to follow him. As we partake of this bread, dear God, which represents his body on the cross and what he went through, we pray, dear God, we will focus on this as we partake. We ask these things in Jesus' name.
Lord's Supper. We'll also have the opportunity to lay by in the store. We know that it takes funds to keep the uh, Lord's work going, and at this time we need to think about what we do each week, not just now, but also prepare before we get to Sunday as what we should do is put what we have first towards God as he's blessed us well. If you would bow with me at this time. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for our jobs. We're thankful, dear God, for what you give us and what you bless us with. We would have nothing, dear God, if it wasn't for you. We pray, Heavenly Father, as we lay by in store, we pray that these funds, dear God, will be used in accordance to your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Thank Roger for that encouraging lesson at this time. Uh, just remember, the services are back at 5 o'clock, and uh, at this time, Brother Jeremy will lead us in a closing prayer. Pray me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the many blessings that you offered us as we depart from here in this building. Let us learn to encourage others to keep our mind and grasp hope. That is with you, Father. That's all that you can come